Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, once again, I want to welcome all of our television viewers, and uh, for those of you who may have never caught our program before, we're just an informal Bible study. We're uh, not associated in our television ministry, at least, with any particular group. We're just trying to open the Word for whatever background you may have come from and uh, learn to appreciate the Word of God. I've, over the years, have used it so often that uh, when Tyndale attempted to get the Scriptures into England, he wanted it to be in the hands of every plowboy in England. And uh, you want to remember that back in the 1600s, plowboys probably just had enough education to read, but nevertheless it was enough to warrant their having a copy of the Scriptures. And so this is what it's for. Uh, we've got our Bibles in our homes, not to collect dust, but to be studied and read, and hopefully this is what we're helping folks to do. So uh, we're going to pick right up in a moment where we left off in our last program, but in the meantime I want to remind you that every last program is available in video on the audio cassette package as well as the little printed booklets. Now we've done it a little different, I guess, than most. We put 12 of these half-hour programs on one six-hour long video, and we've done that for two reasons, to keep the cost down and to keep your shelf space down. It's a lot easier to shelf space one videotape as it would be three. So anyway, these are all uh, formats of uh, 12 programs and the same way with the audio and the little booklets. All right, let's get right back to where we left off in Colossians chapter 1 <coughs> and verse 20. And uh, for those of you who maybe just tuned in in the last few days or a few weeks or whatever, remember that these epistles of Paul Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians were written from prison in Rome. And that's why they're many times referred to as the prison epistles. And uh, as I put it on the board when we started our uh, study of Ephesians, that when you come through Romans and Corinthians and Galatians, that, that's pretty much down at the elementary or the, the basis of Paul's teaching. And then all of a sudden you just sort of jump up another tier and get into the deeper aspects of Paul's doctrines on these prison epistles. And so Colossians is one of these little epistles written to a congregation of which he did not have a part of founding himself. No doubt it was some of his converts from Ephesus who had gone on over to the city of Colossae, which is not too far uh, south and little east of Ephesus, and the same way with the city of Laodicea. And so Colossians is a letter that is written by the apostle to people whom he had never met personally. But the admonitions in them uh, in these chapters are just as real as in any of his other letters, and we'll be coming to some of the warnings. Now you want to remember that a good share of Paul's writings were not only to teach us the plan of salvation, not only to teach us how to live as Christians, but to warn us of the dangers that are constantly besetting Christianity. In fact, you know, when I, when I look back at history and uh, the paganism of the Roman Empire and then all the religious differences that have permeated the human race, I always have to come away, but for the grace of God, Christianity would have never survived. And it's amazing that it survived, but it did. And so we now read these little epistles with all that in mind. Yes, it's bringing forth the plan of salvation. It's teaching us how to live, but it's warning us what to be aware of all around us. All right, now then, coming down into verse 20, and having, that is, God the Son, who we've been talking about now for the last several verses, and having made peace, that is, with sinful mankind, having made peace through the blood of His cross. Now, I'm going to have to stop there in the word peace. Now, when the world thinks of peace, what do they think of? Absence of war. Absolutely. The world is always talking about peace. Peace in the Middle East, 
peace in Yugoslavia, peace in Africa, wherever there's turmoil, the world's politicians are always talking about peace. Well, they're not talking about a relationship between God and men, they're talking about the absence of warfare between human beings. But the word peace here is talking about God's relationship with sinful men, all right? And so having made peace through the blood of his cross. Remember several programs back, I made mention of the verse in Hebrews that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, and I called it a what? An absolute, see? It's an absolute. There is absolutely no way of being restored into fellowship with the Creator God short of the shed blood. It's an absolute. All right, now I'm going to bring you back, if you will, to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Because it's a word that, that Paul uses quite freely in his writings, this peace with God. Now the, the secular world out there is not at peace with God. They're his enemies. And we'll show that in, in Romans chapter 8 in just a moment. But for you and I who believe, we are at peace with God. We are not in a spiritual warfare against him. We have peace with God. All right, this verse shows it so clearly. Romans 5, verse 1. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, which of course is a Pauline term, we have, past tense, it's already done, once we're justified, we have peace with God. Now that's quite a statement, isn't it? God no longer has a controversy with the believer. God is absolutely content that the moment we believed and he finished the work of justification, there is no longer any reason for him to have enmity between us and him because he has now given us that peace that only he can give. And it's not just an absence of war, it is a relationship of love, see? So being justified by faith, we have peace, with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And now since we're justified and we have peace with God, it's that same one then who gives us access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. So you can't separate salvation from grace because none of us deserve salvation. None of us deserved what Christ did for us. And it's all of grace. And how few, even believers, understand that. All right, another place where Paul uses this peace with God is in Philippians. And we looked at that not too many weeks ago. Philippians chapter 4. And it is in relation to our prayer life. As we make requests. Philippians chapter 4. We always like to start verse 6. My two favorite verses when it comes to prayer. All got it? Philippians chapter 4, dropping down to verse 6, where he says, Be careful or worry about nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. There are no strings attached there. That is a free access into the throne room and to let all of our supplications and requests known with thanksgiving. But then verse 7, that regardless of how, how God answers, He may not spare our loved one who may be terminal. He may not grant healing to them. He may not save something that we think needs to be saved, a financial empire or a marriage or something like that, and, and the Lord may not answer the way we think He should. But the next verse is the answer, and that is that the peace 
of God. See? That which was imparted to us the moment we believed. That we are no longer in a warfare against Him. We are no longer His enemy. But we are at peace with Him. And we have a peace that passeth all understanding. In other words, you can't explain it. There's no way we can explain this peace with God. It's beyond it. But we know it's there. And so it will keep our hearts and mind. All right, now I said I will show you the other side of the coin, the flip side, and that's back in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Been a long time since we taught Romans. My goodness, I didn't realize it was years ago. Do you know that? Boy, we taught Romans back in 93, I think. And uh, so I guess it won't hurt to dip back into it and uh, review some of these things. Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 5. <clears throat> Romans 8, beginning at verse 5. Now there's some, there's some stark statements in here. They're shocking. For they who are after the flesh, in other words, the lost world around us, they who are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. See, that's all they can think about. But they who are after the Spirit, in other words, the believer, they mind the things of the Spirit. Verse 6, for to be carnally minded, in other words, to be constantly wrapped up in things, is death. There's no spiritual life in things. But to be spiritually minded is life and what again? Peace. See, that same peace with God. Now verse 7. This is, the why it is, this is why it is the way it is. Because the carnal or the unsaved, unregenerate mind is, what's the next word? Enmity. Now, do enemies have peace? No, they're in a constant warfare, whether it's nations or whether it's communities or whatever. When you've got warfare, you've got a lack of peace. And so here again, there is no peace between God and the lost individual because he is carnal and he is an enemy against God. And the carnal mind is not subject, reading on in verse 7, the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, because there, there's nothing that is compatible. Nothing. They are totally separated. That's why in a little bit we get back to Colossians, we're going to see the word reconciliation. But here there is no reconciliation between God and the lost person because they are fleshly minded and they have no interest in the things of the Spirit. All right, now then, verse 8. So then, they who are in the flesh, they have never been justified by faith, they have never been reconciled, and so they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Do they like to pray? Well, you bet they do. Oh my, whenever they've got a need, they pray. Well, do you think God is interested in their prayers? No, because they're enemies. He's not going to answer the prayer request of an enemy. They're not his children. Now, I've always made the statement, yes, when a lost person cries out for salvation, God hears him. Absolutely he does. Before he even calls, Isaiah says, before, before I even called, you answered. But in everyday mundane things, when the lost person prays, God doesn't hear him. He's an enemy. You know, I've used the illustration years ago on the program. I know I did. If your neighbor's kid comes up to you someday and says, hey, I want a new bike. Will you get me one? I think it'd be a rare individual to say, well, come on, son. Let's go down and I'll buy you one. No, what will we usually say? Well, that's your dad's job. That's not my responsibility to buy you a bicycle. Your dad can do that. I'll buy my kids one, but I'm not going to buy you one. Why? Because they're not our kids. Well, you see, that's just normal. Now, that's not being mean-spirited or anything like that. It's just simply good economics. You can't buy bicycles for all the kids up and down the block. But hopefully you can buy one for your own. All right, now, God doesn't treat the human race much differently. If there is no love for him and there are enemies for him, 
He's not going to be hearing their prayers until, of course, they call for salvation, and then he becomes the God of everything. All right. So then they that are in the flesh, verse 8, cannot please God. And then you come down to verse, oh, let's see, verse 13. And this sort of winds up this little dissertation about people who are still in the flesh, who have never been saved. Verse 13, for Paul writes, if you live after the flesh, if all you're concerned about is the things of this world, you have no concept of eternity. Now there again, Iris and I talk of it so often as we travel and the, the highways are packed with people. And we can't help but wonder. You can't judge. I never try to, but I can certainly wonder. How many of these people that we're meeting on these freeways or on the streets of our cities, how many of these people ever for a moment consider eternity? How many ever stop to think of something of the spiritual? I don't believe it ever enters their mind for the most part. I hope I'm wrong, but I don't believe it does. They're so wrapped up in the things of this world, see? And so this is their, their future, that if all they're living for is the flesh, in other words, that, that home that is probably beyond their budget, those cars that are beyond their budget, and their credit card bills that are beyond their budget, they're living for the flesh. They're under all the pressures of the world. They've got no time for God. They've got no time for the spiritual. And so, Paul says, if that's your lifestyle, you shall die spiritually. You've got no hope for eternal life. But the flip side, if you through the Spirit do put the death, in other words, put these things of the flesh out of your thinking, you shall live eternally. And so it becomes then quite an option. Are you going to live for the flesh and die for eternity? Or are you going to live spiritually here? and maybe miss out on a few of the things that the world thinks they have to have and live eternally. It's quite an option. It's a choice, see? All right, back to Colossians. I guess I can finish the next half hour in the next word, can't I, Jerry? <laughs> Reconcile. <laughs> it's another one. I mean, these are, these are doctrinal terms that too many people never consider but they are so basic to our faith. All right, reading on now in verse 20, having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him, that is, the one who finished the work of the cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. In other words, again, where does it put Christ? in the preeminence. Everything is under his control. Everything, as you saw back in one of these earlier verses, were created for his pleasure. You and I were created for his pleasure. And so the whole idea of the work of the cross was to grant us justification, to give us peace with God, and now the next one is to reconcile us. Reconciliation, now that the true Greek meaning is to turn from something totally in the opposite direction and be reconciled over here. Now, a lot of times we, we speak of reconciliation in uh, married couples who may have a marriage that's just simply, as we say today, going on the rocks. But hopefully, and I know I've been instrumental in a few of them, and it just thrills us to death when you can bring that estranged husband and wife, and you bring them back together. And what do we call it? Reconciliation, see? They've turned from their direction of going apart from each other, and they have turned 180 degrees, and they have come back together. We call it reconciliation. Well, that's exactly what God has done with us. Every one of us as a believer has been reconciled to God. We were going away from Him. We had no thought for Him. We had no love for Him. But there came a time when all of a sudden the power of God just literally 
hooked us, didn't it? And just brought us to himself. And in the process of that, he reconciled us to himself. Now, the best portion of scripture to define that is 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'm going to start at verse 17, honey. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we'll jump in at verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we'll drop down to verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's now a member of the body of Christ. He is a new creature or a whole new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Well, that doesn't need any comment. It's self-explanatory. Now verse 18, here it comes. And all things are of God. Why? Because he's the creator of everything. You know, we've been studying the life of Joseph in a couple of our classes here in Oklahoma the last several nights. And I've seen it before, but it, it never just struck me quite so, so hard as it has this time. All those bad things that happened to young Joseph. What did Joseph tell those brothers over and over? God was in it. God was in it. And see, this is what we have to realize even for us as believers today. Not one moment of our life is without God's awareness and control. We're in his control. God is above everything, see? And this is what we have to understand. Even the bad things. God is in it to fulfill his own purposes. Now in the story of Joseph, of course, it was so evident. Had Joseph not been sold into slavery, had Joseph not ended down second man of Egypt, Jacob and the other sons wouldn't have had the opportunity to go and cash in on the granaries of Egypt. But since Joseph was there, had the grain, the family survived. And that's why Joseph said, you didn't do it, God did it. Now that's hard for us to comprehend, isn't it? And you know, you've heard me make the statement over and over, especially those of you who are in my Oklahoma classes. One of the hard things to comprehend is that when God began this whole system of the human race, and he set Adam and Eve out of the garden, and he set them free with a free will. And he did the same thing with nations. And so men of nations have been coming through human history making their own decisions, pretty much. There is no puppet on a string involved whatsoever. And yet here we are 6,000 years removed and where are we in God's timetable? Right on the minute. Right on the minute. The whole world after 6,000 years is exactly where God blueprinted it. And yet he never took away the freedom of men and nations to pretty much do as they thought they wanted to do. Amazing, isn't it? All right, now the same way here, see? All things, verse 18, all things are of God. Now don't ever stop and try to tell me, oh, there's too many people for God to keep track of. Oh, listen, there's more stars out there, and as I mentioned in the last half hour, none of them ever bump into each other. There's far more stars to keep track of than there are people. And that's why the scripture can even bring it on down that he knows the number of hairs on our head. See, of every individual. So don't ever limit God. Don't ever say, well, he doesn't know about me. Oh, yes, he does. And so all things are of God. But for us who believe, it's the God who has reconciled us to himself. In other words, as we were going away and away and away from God, he and his mercy and grace just literally brought us back to himself. You know, I guess I got time. I had an elderly gentleman, I think it was from West Texas, I'm not sure. But he called and he was well up into his 70s, if I remember correctly, and he said, Les, he said, I have just all of a sudden, 
as a result of your program, gotten a hunger for the Word. He said, it's the first thing I do when I get up in the morning, and the last thing I do before I go to sleep. And he says, to think that I wasted all those years with no interest in the spiritual things. And I said, you know, you remind me, and I've shared it with several of the people in Oklahoma in the last week. I said, you remind me of something that Winston Churchill said. And you're going to smile because you're going to remember when he said it. He said, youth is wonderful. But what a pity that it had to be wasted on young people. <laughs> See, and isn't that exactly what we've done? They waste all those good productive years just simply spending them to satisfy the flesh. And then when they get older, they suddenly realize, hey, this is far better. Why couldn't I have experienced this for the last 40 years? Well, it's one of the uh, questionable things, I guess, of the human experience. Well, anyway, all things are of God who hath reconciled himself by Jesus Christ. But it doesn't stop there. Now, as soon as we are reconciled, what has God given us? The ministry of reconciliation, in other words, were to help others be reconciled. See? And there's no more thrilling thing that you can do. Now, like I've already mentioned, if you can bring an estranged husband and wife together, and maybe there's some little kids at home that are torn by all this, my, is there anything more thrilling than to reconcile those two people and save the home and recreate a joy and a happiness? Hey, that makes you feel pretty good. Well, the same way if you can do this with a lost person. If you can be instrumental in bringing that person to a knowledge of salvation and to be able to say, hey, I've reconciled, uh, I've been a part in reconciling someone to God. And so this is our ministry, that we are to be reconciling lost people to their creator, God. Well, let's see, I think I got half a minute left. And so you come back to Colossians. And again, we are to reconcile all things unto himself, why I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And then verse 21, and you who were at one time alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he, Christ Jesus, has what? Reconciled. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felder.